All right, let's get started. So we've got a really cool topic to discuss in the next two hours. We will take a break in the middle. Um, the topic is petrochemical fires and repairs. If you don't mind advancing to the next slide. So I'd like to introduce to you our two speakers. Robert Cunningham, who's based out of Houston. He has 20 years of experience in petrochemical refining and production facilities, with a focus on construction for brownfield uh, projects. His experience with turnarounds and large scale maintenance works, and has worked on the owner side for response teams following fires, explosions, and hurricanes. We also have Gabriella Myers, joining us from Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Um, she has 10 years of experience at BP in financial and LP modeling, economic evaluations, cost and production forecasting and reporting. Gabriella does a lot of data heavy analysis for mid to large scale energy losses and business interruption claims. It's a really cool topic. Um, we're talking about mega, mega, mega sized claims. And uh, we're very happy to have Robert and Gabriella join us today. So uh, Gabriella, or sorry, Robert, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for that. Uh, again, my name is Robert Cunningham. Uh, I live in Houston, Texas. Um, you know, understanding most of uh, audiences up in Canada, I will say I was kind of born and raised in South Dakota, so I don't have um, a Texas twang, but you may hear the long O's. Um, so it's really great to be with everybody today. Um, I'm going to walk you through just kind of general energy in general, um, the different types of assets you see and, and where we see claims. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Gabby and it'll really kind of get into the what I'll call the meat of the presentation, which is these large complex losses come with very large data sets as everybody moves to like a paperless type um, payment system. So looking at um, energy sources, and this is all based on US data sitting in Houston, but I, I think it largely extrapolates well to North America. Um, you have, of course, the petroleum industry, which is what we all you know, probably think about, at least in Texas, when we talk about energy. Um, and so you're talking about the exploration, extraction, and refining and transporting. Um, just to kind of tie this to my experience, my experience in petroleum production is offshore uh, Gulf of Mexico, um, again, doing brownfield projects, debottlenecking type things to increase capacity or production. Um, for the natural gas industry, and this is really where Gabby's experience was with BP, but it's similar type extraction methods to petroleum, but you're getting out um, gas. Um, and largely in the North American market, these are more onshore type assets. Um, of course, moving forward, you get into you know, renewable uh, energy which it's been around for a couple of decades, but really is seeing a big growth now as we, you know, as a globe, we work on a, a carbon neutral type environment. And when you think about renewable energy, um, you have solar panels, uh, which I have on my house. Um, you have solar farms, which kind of use your solar reflecting off the mirrors to heat up water. So you're still using that traditional steam cycle uh, to generate power out of that. Um, you know, and then wind farms, um, you know, here in Texas, and I know up in uh, the Canadian offshore, you're starting to see a lot of um, wind farms being developed offshore where you have, you know, more consistent winds and stuff. So that's, that's a really interesting, at least for me, very interesting from my perspective, because it used some of my background from offshore, but you're now putting out, you know, renewable energy assets. So for me, that's a really exciting uh, area industry is going. Um, moving on, you have coal, um, you know, probably one of our <laughs> earlier energy sources, definitely on the decline. Um, you know, you, there's interesting things you can do with coal, but it's just very carbon intensive. Um, and then lastly, you have the nuclear industry. Um, really great. I think it's a great piece of carbon zero. Uh, just, you know, at least in the U.S., we need to figure out what to do with that uh, the spent rods. Go ahead, Gabby. Um, 
so if you really take a step back and say, well, what is energy, right? Like, what are we really talking about here? Um, you know, energy is the ability to do work, right? Um, thinking about that, you kind of have this, you know, four types that we look at, you think about heat. Um, and then of course you have electrical, which is broadly speaking generated from heat. Um, you know, most of our electricity comes from creating heat in one form or fashion, boiling water, <laughs> running a turbine. Um, moving forward, you have the chemical uh, piece. And then of course you have gravitational, which is getting into your hydroelectric dams, those pieces. Right, go ahead. Um, primary uses. If you think about, you know, where we see energy um, at a personal, our personal lives, you see it kind of in residential and then really transportation, right? So residential, you might have electricity, gas, um, those type services at your house, you know, transportation is of course vehicles, which, you know, traditionally have run on gasoline and we're now converting to, um, you know, lithium ion cells and kind of that renewable aspect. Um, from there, you look at electrical power, which, you know, again, is part of supplying our residential needs and our transportation needs. You have commercial and then of course industrial and industrial is where uh, myself and Gabby primarily work for um, is supporting insurance claims. Um, and, you know, for industrial, uh, it's, you know, it's very broad when you think about it, but really we're looking at, you know, those kind of large scale industrial uh, facilities. Am I good? So if you look at kind of U.S. petroleum products consumed and, and look at these percentages, this gives you an idea of where we use our, our crude products, right? So a little over 40% of refined crude goes into gasoline. And this is primarily automobiles and transportation. On top of that, you have another 20%, which is diesel. Um, again, broadly speaking, used in transportation. Maybe you still have some diesel boilers and stuff. Growing up as a kid in South Dakota, we actually had a diesel boiler um, in our house for heat. Um, from there, you move to NGLs or natural gas liquids. Those, um, while can be used for combustion sources, mainly go into kind of your chemical industry um, as raw materials with, you know, really starting to produce plastics, right? Um, but just looking at this right here, you already see that in the US, 60% of all of our refined petroleum is used for, you know, road transportation. Um, and so you think about from a carbon neutral standpoint, you know, just getting to a non, or getting to a renewable energy source, we start reducing 60% of our petroleum consumption pretty quickly. Um, from there, you have uh, jet fuel, still gas, and then a lot of other kind of smaller ones, which are very important in kind of the global economy, but make up a very small usage, right? So um, you have asphalt, obviously for paving roads, um, other feedstocks that go into the chemical industry. You have Coke, which you can, you know, um, is used in electronics and other parts of the industry. Um, Resid fuel oil or sometimes bunker fuel, some ships still burn that. Um, and then the very last one and probably one of your more profitable pieces, at least right now from the, a barrel of oil is your lubricants. Um, looking at this, like where we're kind of going with the slide is we're, we're moving to the crack spread. So as we look at, you know, petrochemical type um, events and you start talking about, well, what's your, you know, lost revenue and stuff, you're, you're really looking at that crack spread. So it's, what does it cost you to buy a barrel of crude oil? And then how much revenue do you make selling it out there? Um, you know, if you're familiar with crude, you'll recognize, you know, depending on where it comes from in the world, its constituent components are different, meaning that, you know, a you know, a barrel of crude from Canada versus a barrel of crude from Texas has different components and therefore you get a different crack spread from each barrel. So when you're looking at this piece and you're thinking about it in terms of an insurance claim and especially BI, understanding that crude source is vitally important to understand the crack spread. 
Um, go ahead, Gabby. So this one's looking at total energy consumption. I think this is, you know, very interesting. You think about, you know, the growth of the U.S. Um, in post-war, you know, starting in the 50s, you have, have lower peace and then um, that energy consumption goes up in the 70s. You know, we had the um, oil crisis then and, you know, at least in, you know, the U.S., I think broadly in North America, you see a big um, investment in energy producing assets, right? Um, more oil wells, more gas wells, um, you know, a lot of development up in, you know, Wyoming, Colorado, that area um, for production uh, fields that have been on the decline and are now being reinvigorated with kind of your uh, fracking uh, parts of the industry. Um, you keep growing and then I think the interesting thing, at least for me, think having spent my entire career working in petrochemicals, you know, you get to the 2000s and if you remember, we were always talking about peak oil, right? When are we going to hit peak oil that we just can't produce anymore globally? And now what's happening is we're getting more efficient as a society. You know, we're, we're using our resources more knowledgeably. We're developing, you know, renewable resources. And we've gone from talking about peak oil in a little over a decade and a half, and we now talk about peak demand. Um, what that shift means in terms of you know, petrochemicals and stuff is you're seeing the shuttering of older, less efficient assets. Um, here on the Gulf Coast, the, the biggest announcement, recent announcement I can think of is, uh, it was Philip 66 refinery in New Orleans. Um, Ida came in, refinery had major flooding. You know, they were without power for an extended period of time. They just recently announced last week that they will be shuttering that refinery. Um, the refinery is roughly 300,000 barrels of production a day. Um, from a U.S. Uh, consumption standpoint, that's a, a percentage point and a half or so, roughly, of production. So, you know, you're seeing um, this reduction of older, less efficient energy assets or energy assets that are maybe have a higher risk profile. Um, and that's a trend we're seeing in the U.S. Um, very greatly. Uh, you know, Holly Frontier shuttered a 40,000 barrel refinery a year, two years ago, and they did some conversions on it to be able to actually produce biodiesel, right? So they converted a, a hydro treater and they now crack sunflower oil and other, other oils like plant oils and they produce biodiesel. Um, the Philadelphia um, refinery fire three years ago that, that refinery has also been shuttered. Um, that was roughly 250,000 barrels of production. So when you think about this, this peak energy curve, there, there is visible impacts as we start getting better at consumption and more efficient in our, in our usages. Go ahead, Gabby. Um, so if you think about the oil and gas industry specifically, um, you have upstream, midstream, downstream, and distribution. When you when you look at upstream, you know there's a couple of type of assets that you know jump jump to people's minds. You have kind of your offshore production assets, and you can have nearshore, which means they're primarily fixed to the the ground and they're on on big legs. And then you'll also have floating platforms offshore, um, you know, spars, FPSOs, TLPs. Um, assets that are really floating and maybe anchored to the bottom. Um, so that's kind of upstream offshore. Upstream onshore is the graphic you see there, right? It's your old kind of pump jacks just slowly going up and down, pulling that, that oil out of the ground. Um, and then of course you have gas pr um, production. Um, and gas doesn't necessarily get pumped out of the ground. It kind of comes out of the ground since it's under pressure and it flows easy because it's gas. But then you look at compression stations and stuff, um, you know, to, to move that. And when you start talking about moving those, that, that produced um, energy or oil or gas, excuse me, you're now kind of moving into midstream. So midstream is, you know, the vast pipeline network networks that we have in the U.S. and Canada to move around this produced uh, crude and gas to um, your refiners and other users, uh, which are primarily industrial, to start kind of moving into the value chain. Um, you know, so for midstream, 
at least in the U.S. I think Canada is the same. I'm sorry, I don't know as much about the Canadian uh, market. Um, you have really old assets, right? And if you think about some notable claims, you know, we've had in the U.S. and I know in Canada, we've had a, um, a fair number of pipeline failures, especially with gas pipelines. And, and when you look at those pipelines, you see that they're 50, 60, 70 years old. And while you know, you maintain them having worked in large projects for operators, you know, when we talk design life, we talk 30, 40, 50 years most. Um, and so when you start thinking about these midstream assets that we have around North America, you know, a lot of them are, are at or past that kind of initial design life that people were thinking about. Um, and so that's, that's another part where we talk about, you know, infrastructure um, investment that, for me is a, a big piece of that um, part. You know, moving on, you get to the downstream segment. This is, of course, you know, your chemical producers, your refining, um, you know, energy suppliers like electricity. And they're kind of that first piece in my mind where you're really getting into a, a different value stream and you're now taking that kind of raw product and you're separating into constituent components and modifying it. And, and getting it for ready for use either by you know, other industrial users and then of course uh, consumers. Um, moving from there, you get into just distribution. Um, thinking about distribution, you know, the easiest one you think about is your local fuel station, right? But there's also your uh, electricity provider, uh, natural gas provider, um, those type uh, pieces for distribution. Um, go ahead, Gary. So looking at the upstream sector for, for oil and gas, what I kind of want to do is just pull out and say, here, here's some of these kind of like major players to give you an idea of when we say upstream oil and gas, who specifically we're talking about, right? And so you have, you know, ConocoPhillips, EOD, Schlumberger, while not um, a producer, is a huge service provider for, for labor and um, um, capabilities. You know, Canadian Natural, Ontario, Apache, Bry, Oxy, all, all these are kind of upstream producers that you think about specifically in oil and gas. Good. Um, you know, again, getting to this, this midstream concept, you now, you've produced it and you're now transporting it, right? So again, once it's extracted, you now need to move it from where it's extracted to where that asset is. Um, Again, as I mentioned, I think this part of the industry is largely not thought about, but once you build a refinery, you can't just pick it up and move it. Um, but as you find you know, oil reserves in different parts, you need to be thinking about, well, how do you get that to a refinery? Um, and so transportation is a really key part of the industry from my perspective that is largely overlooked. Um, you know, and then, this transportation is your midstream uh, people. So if you think about midstream, you know, this is again, moving the product. You, know, you have TC Energy, um, Kinder Morgan, Williams, uh, Enbridge, as I mentioned, uh, Energy Transfer, Mark West, Coke. Um, you have a lot of different companies that own pipelines throughout North America, moving, you know, produced oil and gas to um, refineries and chemical plants. Um, so getting into refining, um, this is where a lot of my experience is, and in terms of the type of work we do, this is a lot of the work we primarily support. Um, refining at the very basic level, if you go back 100 years, it was maybe one or two units. You would take that crude oil, you would heat it, and at different temperatures in your distillation column, which that's a representation of, you'd have different you know, densities of liquid kind of condensing out, right? Um, and if you look at it, the heaviest is at the bottom, the lightest is at the top. And those first refineries were really just separating that crude into constituent components and then, you know, running off of that. Um, if you think about maybe what that means in terms of everyday life, if you look at like the gasoline stream or fuel for cars, um, the gas you were burning back then would probably not burn at all well in your current car or your car wouldn't run well. Um, you know, you'd have like engine knocking and just a lot of variability there because you weren't doing any additional refining on that gasoline stream. You're just kind of taking off that um, 
that cut of the crude unit. Um, but but looking at this this piece too, I think it's important to think about. And this is again, you know, going back to that earlier slide where we talked about, you know, a crudes from a different field have different components, right? And you know, broadly speaking, while you may get all of these components, you can get them in very, very differing degrees. So if you think about, you know, the 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 tar sands up in Canada, those are primarily made of your your components at the bottom of your distillation tower, right? So it's a bit of caro, lots of diesel, fuel, oil, and then what we call resid or really heavy um, heavy components. You know, and where that really gets into is if you think about from that perspective and you go now think about midstream, it's harder to transport something that's less liquid, right? And so just that different crude creates a different challenge in how do you transport it. And then when you get that specific crude to refinery, you know, refineries were designed, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago with a, a particular type of crude in mind. And maybe if you're changing crudes, you need to figure out how to balance the different types of crudes from different fields into your refinery to kind of maximize that throughput and capacity. So if you're running on a, if you're buying a Canadian tar sand crude, for instance, you're gonna to wanna to try to find a lighter crude to pair with it so that you get more of the top ends coming out unless you've specifically designed your refinery just to handle uh, heavier crudes. Um, moving on. Okay, so this refining moves you now into downstream, right? So, you know, downstream, you talk about Marathon. You know, I mentioned Philip 66, Valero is another big refiner, um, Holly, CVR, uh, Delic. And these are kind of, you know, refiners you see in the US and North America, and they're really taking those crudes again and moving them into the fuels that we think about and use. All right, go ahead. Um, and that leaves last thinking about integrated oil and gas companies. So, you know, an integrated company basically owns different parts of the, the oil and gas business. You know, for me, my, a lot of my career was spent at BP. Um, at BP, I worked in, you know, refining. I worked a little bit in what they had left of the chemicals business to that point. And then I also worked upstream. Um, and so, of course, the idea of integrating is that you, you know, remove this kind of transfer uh, cost loss. Um, next, you have Shell, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, you have Suncor. Um, thinking about where we are today as a society in the, the global market, what's interesting is if you take an integrated oil and gas company, these are the companies that are really trying to uh, change and pivot their business models into more of a... Um, you know, carbon neutral energy company. Um, again, having worked for BP, lots of friends still there. What that means for like a BP is they aren't investing in traditional oil and gas fields as much anymore. What they're really looking at is how do we get into, you know, renewable energy. So you're seeing BP invest in uh, wind farms and they have investments in solar. Um, and then BP is also looking at how do we put fast charging stations at, at their network of um, gas stations, right? So fast charging for EVs. Um, you know, and it also makes an interesting thing. So again, in, in the U.S., you're seeing like Shell just sold off their refinery here in, in Deer Park right outside of Houston. And they sold that refinery over to Pemex. Um, as a as a, a refiner, you know, it was, a, it was hard. And having worked in that refinery and visited for insurance claims, you know, it's a true um, traditional oil refinery in that it's always been owned for its entire 80 some year lifespan by Shell. You know, so you, it, it is truly a Shell asset. So seeing, seeing that change happen really shows that global shift we're seeing in the energy industry as people work towards carbon neutral um, and getting out of what we would think of as traditional energy production. So kind of having laid out all of that, what is energy, where it's at, I tried touching upon the assets, you know, really now it's time to talk about, well, types and frequencies of losses within the industry. Um, I was able to get North American data for this, so I'm very happy. Um, but, you know, just kind of a, a question for self-reflection, you know, when you think of a, a, a loss in the oil and gas industry, 
what do you imagine, right? Um, I think what most people imagine, at least when I talk to you know friends and explain to what, what I'm doing now, is I think you know that big fire that you see in the upper right hand corner, right? A, a big refinery on fire, a huge unit, a huge loss. You know, but we also have on the Gulf Coast, we have major flooding events in which you see in that photo. Um, so where I'm going with this is when I talk to friends that I used to work with and I tell them what I'm doing now, they're just like, oh, you must not be very busy, are you? Um, and so here, this slide is to dissuade you of that. Um, so if you look at these kind of losses, you know, in North America, you have what roughly 10 large events per year. Um, and by large events, this is kind of like national newsworthy events. Um, unfortunately, these type of events usually do result in loss of life. Um, and that helps them make the news or they're in major metropolitan areas. Um, you know, I can think of, um, you know, we had a tank farm fire here in Houston, right in the ship channel, which is kind of in the middle of Houston uh, three years ago. And it was on the national news for several days because just the black smoke covering the city as these huge storage tanks burned. Um, you know, so that's, that's 10 of those events a, uh, a year in North America. You know, kind of moving on, you probably have an additional 20 events, which I will say make local news type things. Um, living in Houston and on the Gulf Coast where we have lots of refining petrochemical and energy production, you know, we, we see this on the news maybe, you know, every couple of weeks where you have, you know, a, uh, a fire in Baytown. Um, and you'll hear there's a shelter in place for Baytown or there's a shelter in place for Beaumont, um, which is really just telling the local community that lives next to those assets, hey, something's going on. The air is probably not the best to breathe. Stay home, stay off the roads. Um, you know, and then moving down within the energy sector alone, you have well over what we'll call 500 mid-market and smaller type losses. Um, and, you know, thinking about that, those would be, um, you know, compressor station out in kind of the middle of the, you know, by a gas field or, you know, gas field compressing uh, gas to send into the pipeline uh, catches fire, fails, catches fire. So you end up with a couple of million dollar loss. Um, you know, there's a potential BI piece as you try to get that rep compressor repaired and replaced. Um, those are mid-market. Um, putting some dollars on these, you know, if you think about claim size, when you say a, a large event, you know, normally property damage, I would say in my mind is going to be, you know, 75 uh, to 100 million um, US, right, or, or larger. Um, you know, that kind of 20 major local news events, there you're talking like that 20 to 50 million in property damage, right? And then of course the mid market and smaller, you're still talking a couple million dollars of damage. Um, <clears throat> yep. Okay. So so moving on, I I'm gonna just for really say if you can see in the top corner, we got this um, slide from Alesco, which is in the London market, Alesco Europe. They put stuff out like this every year. They pull the data from Willis Tower Watson's energy industry loss. Um, but I really like this slide because it shows in 2020, it gives you an idea of the magnitude of these claims, right? And if you look, you know, starting at the top, you know, you see there's South Korea, there's a fire explosion, uh, VCE, it's vapor cloud explosion. So basically think about um, something that's a heavy gas, like we talked about natural gas liquids, kind of coming out of a pipeline, um, coating an area and just looking for that ignition source, right? Uh, those type of things, you want them to catch fire as fast as possible because that means less gas covering an area, a larger and larger area. You know, that's that's a four hundred and forty million dollar uh, loss. Um, you know, for downstream, you know, keep moving on. You look at the U.S. You know, for the first top one for the U.S. for windstorm, one hundred and seventy five million. Um, so just giving you an idea of that kind of top ten losses here in the globe all but the bottom one is $100 million or greater of total loss. Um, you know, if you kind of look in that lower left corner of the slide that Alesco produced, you see, you know, what they're calling for 2020 downstream losses, they, they have 70 in their database for a total of $3 billion, right? 
Uh, the top 10 losses are, make up a little over 60% of that. Um, and then you kind of see a breakdown between, you know, 2 billion of that dollars is for oper operating assets and a billion of the dollars is on assets in construction. So great slide. There's, if you, if you get more curious about this type of data, you can just look for Alesco on Google or your favorite web browser or web search engine. Um, and there's a really great slide pack they have of about 30 slides covering these type different um, like factoids within the energy industry for losses. Okay, so moving on. Um, <laughs> looking at causation categories that we see when we go out and look at claims, right? Um, you know, one of the things you're really seeing, especially as assets get older and more expensive to operate, is just lack of proper maintenance, right? So if you think about, you know, a refinery, you have your, you know, your cost of your, cost of your crude, you have the sales price of your products, and then the other cost that you really only have control over is your internal cost. Well, your labor is fixed, but the one thing you can really look at is how much are you gonna spend on preventative maintenance, right? And proper maintenance. And so a lot of times when we see losses, it, you kind of dig into it like, oof, man, just, you know, just lack of maintenance and really old equipment, right? Um, and another area you see lots is just human error. And that can be either on the operator. So the people operating the asset, maybe they made a bad decision as an upset was occurring or um, something of a contractor. And if you think about that piece, from an operations standpoint, when you're working in one of these plants, the, the highest risk period is whenever you're moving through what I'll call a transient state. Right. So once you get that kind of plant up and running and you set, you get the cruise control set, you know, everything can kind of like come along. You know, a lot of the type of losses we see are when you're bringing an asset down for maintenance or back up for maintenance. Right. And so you're in that kind of transient period where you're either adding heat um, or removing heat and energy from the plant to uh, be able to work on it. You know, if you think about human error and contractors, this is really getting into when that asset is down for maintenance. Um, you know, we have a current claim at a refinery now, I can't name, um, but what literally happened is a contractor was driving a fork, forklift uh, with um, a pallet of parts lifted through a part of the refinery he wasn't really supposed to be in, but it was a shortcut. And that top of that forklift clipped a transfer line that was live and was moving fuel or what would be a component of fuel gasoline. Um, very fortunately in that event, nobody was seriously injured, nobody died, um, but you know, the resulting damage right now is roughly 40 million of property claims and they're still sorting out the BI, but you know, let's just say it's starting at the 50 million uh, mark and moving up depending on how fast they can repair it. Um, Moving on, and these are also in the order that we see them and they kind of happen, is you have weather type events. Um, you know, again, hurricanes, tornadoes, if you're in that part of the country, um, you know, damage caused by fires due to climate change, like see a lot in California with our electrical system. And the last one that you see is what we'll call a design defect. Um, the picture on the screen is from when I was at BP and we, we put the Thunder Horse asset out in the Gulf of Mexico. And what you're seeing is they had just floated it out over the field and a hurricane was moving into the Gulf. And so they, they got it moored and hooked up properly. And what they found is, I think is one, a couple of the ballast valves, you know, moving water in the tanks to kind of keep it level have been installed incorrectly. And so when they thought they were open, they were closed. And so when they kind of got this, the, the ship, because it is a ship, ready for the hurricane and put everything you know, there in operations and then moved off the ship, you know, the ballasting system wasn't working correctly. And so what you're seeing is, this is actually, they had been working on it, pumping out the tanks. When they first got out and saw that asset, if you look on the left-hand side of the platform where that red crane is, that was basically in the water. Um, so you do see design defects as well. And again, because of the, you know, especially in the petroleum and petrochemical industry, you know, design defect can have a huge impact on the asset, 
right? Because these are very highly integrated pieces of equipment and uh, plans going on. So moving into the type of claims we see based off of those causations, of course, you have property damage, and from there, you know, we'll we'll help with origin and cause. Uh, you can do damage assessments, which is really the cost to repair. Um, you know, sorry, let me step back. I was rushing through, but um, if you think about origin and cause, you know, these highly specialized assets do take a level of knowledge um, to go and help figure out what went wrong. I, I caught the last end. The, the tail end of the last presentation for the um, electrical failures. And I think that gives you a really solid idea of the specialized nature that comes into, you know, evaluating what was this failure mechanism, right? Um, another thing we do a lot of is we help with the damage assessment and that's the cost to repair. Um, for folks not familiar with insurance and stuff at an industrial level, I always explain it as, you know, that time you, you dinged your car and you had to, had to take it, and your adjuster said, hey, go here, and this guy's going to help you figure out how much it's going to cost so we know what to pay you. That's where we're, we're playing into it. So we're, we're helping um, translate kind of what is that cost that the operator has to spend to repair the equipment? Is it, is it reasonable, right? You know, does it, does it make sense? Um, and just giving that specialized knowledge to help with that cost repair. Um, another thing we work on is obviously the time to repair. You get into these BI pieces and there's a lot of questions about, well, how long does it really take? Um, so again, if you think about that fire, I just mentioned for the 40 million, the fire was on a distillation tower, right? And that's, you know, a big tower that's about four foot in diameter, 60 foot tall. Well, how long does it take to repair a distillation tower? Um, unless you've have, have worked on that type of equipment and been involved in, you know, maintenance or, you know, projects doing that, it, it, there's, it's a kind of a variable question that's hard to ascertain without that specialized experience. Um, you know, another type of claim is, you know, your kind of car, car claims, and those also come with delay and startup. And again, working within those claims, you do have, um, you know, the need for origin and cause and understanding where was that defect? Is there the potential for subrogation? On these type claims, you're looking a lot at, um, is there a, a design defect that the owner, right, um, designed into the plant? Or is there a design defect that maybe as the contractors were taking over their piece of the work, designed in, right? Um, and, and you see, you see, you'll see both sides of that when you think about that design defect um, asset. And then of course, in these ones, you still have a damage assessment, right? And that cost to repair, um, it's basically identical to what you see for property damage, though for energy assets, the interesting part is if you're working in a refinery in the US, US or North America, Canada, you're looking at something that's probably 30, 40 years old at least, right? If you're sitting there on a construction policy and you're looking at a, a damage assessment and cost to repair, they haven't even technically, you know, using that car analogy, that car hasn't even been driven off the lot yet and they have damage to it. And you're now talking about repair costs. Um, and of course the, the, the discussion there always goes from like, well, how about I just go buy a new one, right? And if that's where the discussion goes, you now get into this time to either repair or replace that asset um, that's just being built, right? And so, there's a lot of work when you think about that time to repair and that, that delay, because if you're repairing it, how long does it take to repair? But if you're purchasing a new one, you now need to understand, you know, global supply chains and stuff um, moving into there for that DSU piece. Um, and then, of course, coming out of these type claims, um, you have business interruption um, in the U.S. for our typical refinery stock. You see refineries that are roughly, let's call it 100,000 barrels. Um, Oh, yeah, thank you, here, Gabby. <laughs> you know, if you, if you kind of look at typical U.S. refinery occurrence crack spreads, daily profit on these assets are about a million a day, right? And if you look at those loss types losses we just talked about, that's a six to eighteen month repair window a lot of times. And you know, million dollars a day for six months, it's one hundred eighty million dollars pretty quickly, right? Um, so when when thinking about what is that BI piece? for an energy asset, you know, the kind of three things I really, you know, we really focus on and we recommend people to focus on when you're looking at it is obviously what is the duration of the repair period, 
um, and then making sure that there's no impacts from intermingling of non-loss related works. Um, you know, taking it to that car analogy, it's, you know, you got rear-ended, but while you're in the body shop, you know, let, let's get that front headlight that's broken fixed as well. Um, and so that's, that's something that you want to look at when you think about duration of repair period. You know, another thing you need to get into then, of course, for BI is what is your commodity pricing, both on your produced products and your consumed products, right? Um, going back to refinery and those different fields and crudes, crudes from different fields have a different price per barrel. So you really want to make sure where are they getting crude from? at the time of the loss so that you can go get proper commodity pricing to understand that consumption cost. Um, and then of course, what the production cost is. And then another issue you see, um, and this is like a PES is a great example. Um, PES refinery in Philadelphia was one of the few refineries left on the East Coast and they had a very unique product slate. The loss of that refinery has distorted pricing within North America for certain um, commodities they produced. You know, so people who are consuming some of their products up on the East Coast are now having to, you know, replace that consumption with products from the Gulf Coast or Europe. And you actually do see a global distortion in that commodity pricing. And that is something you wanna look at when you think about a business interruption claim for these large energy assets. I go on. Um, you know, another thing too, and we're seeing more, more and more of this is, you know, these contingent business interruption claims. Um, thinking again, I'm, I'm using PES because we're working on several claims, contingent claims around that piece. You know, you have contingent business interruption for people that were supplying crude to PES. And you also have, again, that contingent business interruption for people who were buying products from PES. Um, and so when you're thinking about one of these CBI claims, it's similar to a BI claim, but there, there is a subtle differences, right? So, you know, duration of the repair period, if you're thinking about a business interruption claim, you kind of have direct access to the information and the operator making the repairs, right? When you're thinking about a CBI claim, you know, you're one step removed and you're kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm pretending I'm on video here. I'm pretending I'm peering over a fence. <laughs> you're kind of peering over that fence to try to see, well, what are they doing? What's that repair look like? You know, and so you really are trying to think about, well, how long should it take someone to do that repair based off of what my limited knowledge of damage is? Um, but you still need to think about that duration of repair because that's what, you know, caps obviously part of your CBI claim. Um, oh, sorry, I wasn't done on that slide. You know, and then of course you get on the CBI, you get into commodity pricing and consumption. Um, again, similar to other you know, goods pricing, but you're also wanting to start thinking about because it is a global market, where are they buying from and the cost of buying from? So um, you can maybe buy a chemical from the Gulf Coast or you could buy it from Asia. There is different transportation costs. And so that's something you want to think about when you look at the CBI and these um, alternative sourcing. And then of course, again, you have um, market distortion as you did in a BI claim, and you wanna understand that market that's being, that was impacted by the loss. And then also kind of that, we'll call it global shuffling of commodities to fill that, that loss. Um, so those are things I wanna just kind of point out, like are great to think about for contingent, contingent business interruption as you're working on these claims. Uh, Go on, I'm, I'm into, my, into my questions time. Great, thank you so much, Robert. So um, really cool information and thank you so much for kind of walking us through step-by-step. Step. A lot of great information. I've got one question so far. Um, so folks, if you would like to ask questions to Robert before um, we take a break, please do so in the Q&A button there on the panel. So the first question or the question that I have here is, how is market distortion typically handled in claims? Will the claim value be typically against the pre-loss or post-loss inflated slash distorted commodity value? Um, so, so quickly, uh, it, it is not an adjuster, don't have a license. Um, 
but in the policies, you do usually see pretty well defined um, formulas for calculating um, that piece, right? So there's, if you're thinking about BI, there's a very clear, usually formula built into how they calculate their exposure and that gives guidance on how you calculate the loss. And, and from there, it really gets into what I call a, a specific policy. So we've seen some where um, if you think about like cost of raw materials, usually that in my experience is consumed in the policy, right? So if they have to buy additional crude from somewhere else, that cost of that crude is paid for. Now, where that market distortion becomes different and then you see um, detuning of the calculation, I'll call it, is your sales price, right? So let's say you're selling a, a chemical. So PES was selling some unique products up there. Um, that's like cumene and phenol and stuff. So they're the only cumene producer on the East Coast. There are several consumers there right? Um, when, they, when they stopped producing cumene, the cost of cumene went up, you know, 15%. And so if you're thinking about that BI calculation, you know, normally the policy would treat it as the pre-loss price for the product. And that is in recognition of that market distortion, right? Because the price only went up because of the loss. Now, you know, we have folks we use um, that are very versed in economics and global trading, and you can also then go in and do a finer slice and say, okay, what, what part of that increase is due to um, loss of a producer? And then also maybe, you know, what is a seasonal fluctuation that you see or just uh, underlying, you know, maybe crude pricing is rising. So you, you can go to that level as well. Um, but broadly speaking, um, consumption pieces are kind of the prices uh, covered by the policy. Uh, rises in sales price um, generally are not. If that helps. Very cool. All right, another question. To what extent are cyber crime losses being felt in the petro petroleum industry recently, and have any trends emerged yet? Um, you know, so for, I can give a broad answer for what I read in the news. We haven't seen a lot. Um, you know, one maybe that you think about is, um, the, it was a residential gas supplier on the East coast. Their entire system was shut down by the hackers. Um, you know, and there was, you know, huge service interruptions across the East coast. Um, so lots of claims. Um, you know, I think what, I can I can say is from my experience talking to different adjusters and uh, carriers, you know, energy producers are just starting to buy into cyber policies, right? Um, and so a lot of producers don't necessarily have a cyber type policy. Um, but I think going forward in this globally connected world, cyber losses are gonna become bigger and bigger um, because it allows groups to make a political statement like we've seen, um, creates huge uh, disruption within our global supply chain. Um, so for me, I think that is something that is going to be an emerging trend that is something to be wary of, uh, especially because, again, <laughs> in North America, older assets mean, you know, broadly mean less investment, which means older cyber systems or cyber prevention systems a lot of times. Cool. Um, I think I think the gas one was someone logged onto their personal email and clicked the link. Right, <laughs> it was one of those type things. Mm. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Um, so we're going to take a ten minute break, and then we're going to continue on in the same topic um, with Gabriella speaking on the second half. So we'll start in exactly ten minutes. Thanks, everyone, and thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, appreciate it.
All right, so let's get started again. We have Gabby uh, joining us, or sorry, Gabriella joining us for the second portion of this presentation. Thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabriella Myers, and I'm based out of the Oklahoma City area and very happy to be part of this conference with you today uh, to continue the conversation about claims within the energy industry space and um, expand on some specific examples of what Robert has discussed and then also just share some of our own thoughts and experiences on these types of claims and some suggestions on things uh, to consider when you're involved in this, in this kind of analysis. Um, so first, I'd like to share a publicly available video of an explosion that occurred at a refinery along the Texas Gulf Coast as an example of the types of losses that you might come across uh, within the energy industry. So I'll just play a couple seconds of this. All right. So as you can imagine, um, the from seeing these images, the extent of damage can be quite significant, like Robert showed on, showed on that slide, and the repair process can be very lengthy. Um, so one of the first things is that just like in many claims in these losses, it is incredibly important to diligently document conditions immediately following the loss. And for here, photos are key. Um, there are so many resources now for photos from drones, drone laser scanning, 360 spherical photos. Um, any or all of these can be especially helpful down the road in the claim as the rebuild process really gets underway in validating the scope of uh, what was done versus what had been in place at the time of the loss. Um, this particular photo was taken on a 360 spherical camera and actually has really cool functionality when it's opened in its native reader, which I won't do now. But um, as Robert mentioned earlier, there are a lot of aging refineries, and sometimes you might find that the documentation and drawings may not be as robust as with some of the newer builds. Uh, so having photos to help piece things together after the fact can be huge. Uh, so just big message here is to document through photo logs as much as absolutely possible um, when you have the opportunity to access the site. Uh, so what we wanted to share with you here today really are the main sorts of objectives or analysis that we typically um, see in these types of energy claims and we'll share some examples and suggestions on things to think about and consider uh, when you come across these. So the first is really going to be the basis of your remaining process, and that's related to the physical damage sustained and validating the extent of that damage and to what level the event caused damage that merits replacement versus repair of equipment or other property, and then also identifying where repairs or replacements are made or were necessary that are based on non-loss related causes. Uh, the second is related to identifying a baseline cost associated with these identified repairs for materials, uh, labor, and equipment, uh, but also identifying buckets of costs that may need to be incurred, but could be subject to policy interpretation by the adjuster, uh, such as code upgrade requirements. Um, this kind of estimate would typically be the basis for being able to set a reserve for the loss. And then the third goes hand in hand with these and has to do with the time component of repairs. And uh, this is applicable even to those claims without business interruption coverage, uh, because the length of time that repairs are undertaken can have an impact on claim related costs such as indirects or overheads, depending on the policy. And then the last bullet on here is related to the detailed analysis of the cost claim to ensure that they are really aligned with the defined scope of damage and repairs. So uh, for this piece related to validating damages, uh, what you'd be looking to do here is understand the nature of the loss, as we discussed previously, things like fire, flood, windstorm, um, and then be able to interpret the damages with this understanding. And what you're really trying to do is be able to segregate the damage that occurred as a result of the event um, from what might be a result of, say, a pre-existing condition. Uh, for example, in this photo, you can see damage 
cause to a knockout drum from the fire. Uh, it was in the heat zone, it sustained damage, but from the inspection reports, this piece of equipment uh, merited replacement based on the pre-existing corrosion issues and not actually from the fire damage. Um, so especially on larger pieces of equipment, uh, we would suggest really being thorough in this piece of analysis as it's crucial to the whole process uh, to be able to identify exactly the scope of damage that is directly related to the event, um, as this has obviously a very material impact on the final repair costs, as well as the timeline of repairs. Then a level down from the major equipment um, is really understanding the damage to the supporting components of these pieces of equipment, such as the electrical instrumentation, structural steel, concrete piping. Um, on the left here, I have the piece of equipment that we previously discussed, uh, but this is really to stand for any of the major pieces of equipment at your site. Uh, while the reactions and kind of money-making processes really come from these big pieces of equipment on the left, the actual replacement cost and time for setting them is generally far less reaching in terms of cost and time versus the replacement of all of the supporting components for this piece of equipment. So once you have really identified these big pieces of equipment as far as being related to actual physical damage from the event that merits uh, repair replacement from an engineering standpoint, what you would then really end up focusing much more time on is identifying these supporting disciplines and quantities and exactly what was there, what was damaged, and an accurate understanding of what that means in terms of replacement in kind for the insured. So this is really an area where we suggest extra diligence in analysis as a lot of scope can start to creep in. Um, insureds, and rightfully so, will sometimes look at putting in better technologies that may not have been available at the time of the initial build, especially keeping in mind that a lot of these plants and refineries were built decades ago. Um, there might be new ideas in terms of better layouts of their facilities or additional upgrades that they'd find useful in their instrumentation. And this is where we strongly emphasize that it, um, it really is crucial that you establish that sort of base case of physical damage as an anchor for the process. And then the follow on conversations can stem from the insured with their adjuster as far as how their individual policy responds to any changes from that base case. So as Robert mentioned previously, some of the causes of these types of events can then lead to impacts in the, rep in the repair process, uh, particularly in these supporting discipline disciplines like piping and electrical uh, that you would want to be able to evaluate and highlight to the adjuster for their application of policy coverage. Um, in one particular example, an explosion happened during the startup, the initial startup and commissioning phase of plant operations. And as part of their root cause analysis process, the insured determined that their structure was improperly designed and needed to be strengthened. Now, because they had the same contractor on site doing these repair and upgrade works, part of what we saw and what you might come across was the need to identify and segregate the material quantities of concrete and structural steel, as well as the proportionate labor and time components to enable the adjuster to appropriately bucket these claimed items. Um, in this particular case, that equated to them undertaking approximately double the amount of concrete work and setting double the amount of structural steel as they had originally designed. And the impact here is in the millions of dollars. Um, but obviously for purposes of an insurance claim, the time, labor, and materials associated with these additional mounts would be out of scope uh, for their coverage. And as I mentioned at the beginning, photos were key in this particular example um, to compare the structures as they were at the initial time of damage to the repair photos as repaired and noting the differences in the structures and thicknesses that way. And then in this case, we were able to go back after seeing that and look through drawings and confirm tonnages and concrete configurations, et cetera. So, what we recommend here to be able to find and identify these kinds of situations, especially on these kinds of scales, uh, like we just discussed is something like this. And this is obviously very simplified, but basically on the left is your damage, your you know loss of vent, fire, flood, freeze. And then you'll go in and do your detailed analysis on exactly what was there and how it was physically damaged by the event. And some of the key pieces for this part would be, you know, the site visit, your photo documentation, inspection reports of the equipment, unit plot plans, which kind of show the layout and configuration of the site 
prior to the event, as well as any kind of electrical cable schedules, instrument indexes, uh, piping diagrams, and that kind of thing that show what was present at site in the direct damage area. And then on the far right would be an example of your output, which is obviously very simplified, but um, in essence, it's the number of pieces of equipment, it's the amount of structural steel, it's all of the supporting disciplines and relative quantities for replacement that are associated with those pieces of equipment that are necessary to put the insured back to the condition they were in prior to the loss. So our suggestion here is to really get this material quantity list in a solid state as early as possible, uh, because this is really what the rest of the process will become contingent on and where um, disagreements will start to arise. Um, again, the reason why it's so critical for this to be done up front and to be done correctly um, then comes down to being able to align the damage with the final claim that's presented. And we'll talk a little more about some examples of that scope reconciliation in a few slides. Um, but for example, so let's say that this is the summary material quantity list that you determined to be damaged by the event, not related to pre-existing conditions, and was necessary uh, to be replaced for the insured to be able to get back to the condition they were in prior to the loss. Now, an example of what you might see and often does happen is that in the course of the rebuild planning, say the electrical team may determine that there are quantities of electrical cabling in the vicinity that would need replacing in the next year. So they decide to go ahead and accelerate the replacement while the unit is already down. And so now instead of 8,000 feet linear feet of cabling, maybe they are now replacing 12,000 feet um, in total. Now the 8,000 in this example would be what was in scope and the additional 4,000 would be considered out of scope for the insurance claim. Um, these 4,000 extra linear feet of electrical cabling translates into additional material cost, into labor cost, and into a time element consideration for work that's done unrelated to the damage. And if all of these quantities were ordered from the same vendor and at the same time and installed by the same labor vendors, then the cost for this additional unrelated work could easily become included in the claim and would need to be identified. But this initial quantities list where you've identified what was truly damaged and merits replacement from the insured event is really what drives being able to identify these exceptions, these you know 4,000 extra linear feet and all of the added cost and time that goes with those. So moving on to analyzing the cost of repair for energy claims. So, so, so far we've talked about quantities. Um, what we're talking about here really relates to taking this list of damaged property and determining the cost to put the insured back to the position they were in prior to the loss. Um, here's where you'll be taking the detailed line items that make up your kind of material quantity summary and applying industry metrics for cost and installation rates, as well as the cost of the supporting disciplines and crafts like your pipe fitters and welders to determine that baseline cost estimate for repairs. Um, this estimate's primarily used by the adjuster as a way to help the carrier set a reserve number for the loss incurred, as well as serves in a sense as an anchor to the claim so that significant variances in claim value from that estimate will have some sort of basis or starting point uh, to really understand the differences and then how uh, these apply to the policy coverage that the adjusters are you know, tuning towards. So our key suggestion is back to really understanding and getting a firm grasp on that material quantity list um, as that just really drives everything in the process. So taking a little step back and thinking about the rebuild repair process for these types of large energy claims, but really kind of in any industry, um, it's important to be able to understand how these insured companies approach their rebuilds and how they plan and manage them so that you can more adequately align your essentially kind of parallel process. So, you know, determining an independent cost valuation on one hand and the insured planning and determining their own cost valuation on the other. And then you can more easily be able to understand and bridge the variances between those two when these arise. Um, so as an example for the energy industry, these refineries and chemical plants, et cetera, primarily utilize a software called Aspen Tech for their production optimization, but also for their cost and estimating. Um, and this is kind of like the industry leading software for process simulation and estimating. 
And our recommendation here, especially for these very complicated losses, is to be able to align your work product in a way that enables you to think and respond as they would in the situation, but obviously with the lens that you'd be specifically and only focused on direct physical damage, replacement and repairs, whereas they may be um, you know, taking advantage of the downtime to run some parallel work that might get picked up in their estimate. So in our example here, you know, by us utilizing Aspen Tech, our estimate output would now be very aligned in format and basis as the insureds, very similar metrics, very similar unit cost assumptions, labor unit assumptions, and it becomes easier to start to see divergences in the estimates because the two processes are running very parallel now. So the key message here is just really being aware of how your industry thinks and plans in general, so that these could be appropriately managed within your analysis and as kind of painlessly as possible. So now we're at the point in the process where we've established the damage that has occurred. We've identified the repairs or replacements that are not due to physical damage. And we've calculated a basis of estimate and a cost associated with getting the insured back to their pre-loss condition. Uh, the next piece, which is always required for a delay in startup, a DSU claim or a business interruption or contingent BI claim is getting to a timeline. Um, constructing a repair period schedule with all of the associated disciplines and pieces that we've previously discussed. And in a similar way as the cost piece, this schedule or timeline uh, will give the adjuster a way to anchor the BI or DSU claim period and the associated dollar amounts based on the number of days or months or, I mean, realistically years that the repairs can sometimes take from the physical damage. Um, and similarly to our observations on the cost estimate software, most insureds build their schedules in Primavera. Um, and this would be another area where we would suggest you consider being able to run the same type of software, same methodologies so that schedules and variances could be tested more robustly. So on the screen, I have just an example of a typical kind of schedule for one of these claims. Uh, you can see these can be multi-year and in red, are the items that drive the critical path of the project and the sequence to completion. Um, this kind of analysis can be very complicated and involved beyond just understanding the quantity and sequencing of work. And so some suggestions that we'd make in this kind of space would be to be very diligent and thorough in documenting assumptions, uh, because these are the areas where you might tend to see a lot of resistance or pushback from an insured. So. Um, for example, on one particular claim, the procurement and lead time windows of equipment was a pretty hot topic um, as our assumptions in the particular situation were that the insured was capable of ordering their long lead vessels and items very soon after the event as the extensive damage to the unit was pretty obvious. Um, the insured stance was that they needed to have very detailed assessments and reports written up before they could go and procure anything. And since the procurement and delivery timelines are in this red critical path, any differences here are driving differences to your duration and costing you know, literally millions of extra dollars. Um, other areas where we've seen a lot of conflict arise is over assumptions on the density of manpower on site or how many people you can have there working on the rebuild or repair, um, or things like how much the productivity of the work crews might be impacted by things like winter weather. Um, again, as you're working through this kind of timeline analysis, always keeping in mind that assumptions are the key to these durations and clearly documenting those assumptions and also why you understand those assumptions to be accurate, um, whether it's an industry standard you can reference or you know, whatever the case, uh, this exercise will end up being pretty critical. So um, once this initial basis is set, the analysis that then occurs is to understand the actual sequence of events as they occur during the period of the rebuild, and then to be able to identify those that are within the scope of the damage repairs, as we talked about previously, and those that are out of scope but still undertaken by the insured, and how the time for these are accounted for. So in these situations, what we're really looking for are concurrent works, kind of like Robert mentioned. Uh, so for instance, the 4,000 additional feet of cabling that was put in and how much time this caused the electrical work to be extended. And as a result, the trailing disciplines, and therefore if it was on the critical path, the actual delay to the startup date. 
So here's an example to illustrate this just very simplified view of the fire that occurred during commissioning and how design updates made their way into repair works. Again, as an outcome of their review, the insured determined that their supporting steel was drastically undersized and they needed to erect additional support structures to address this design deficiency. Um, perfectly understandable and reasonable in their situation. However, for our purposes, not related to direct physical damage of the insured property. And in this situation, uh, the time highlighted in yellow that was determined to be associated with the installation of these structures would be out of scope for our purposes. And in the same example, uh, the insured replaced all of their um, electrical cabling that was damaged with like kind materials after the fire. Um, but then later before startup determined that the designed cabling was insufficient and they removed portions of it and reinstalled upgraded fire resistant cabling. Again, perfectly understandable replacement, uh, but out of scope for a like kind replacement of damaged property and thus the time for this replacement would also be out of scope. So as you can see, even in the schedule, having that very strong initial materials list is vital to being able to identify and define the correct scope within your timeline. Um, now, because of the extreme complexity of refinery and energy operations in general, what on the surface could appear to be, you know, kind of a simple timeline analysis can actually, and generally always is a much more um, complicated analysis. In this next example that we have is a timeline analysis that's part of the events stemming from the severe winter storms, uh, particularly winter storm URI uh, this past February. And there's a lot of ongoing conversation between policy carriers and interpretations on the legal front on coverage issues, et cetera, you know, that we're not involved in. But the portion that you might be asked or tasked with is determining the different buckets of timeline impact from this type of event. Uh, for instance, in this case, um, two plants that had pipeline feed and streams running between them. So say plant one produced a product that uh, was a necessary input for a process in plant two and would be transferred via a pipeline for processing. In this particular situation, the plants were undergoing routine planned maintenance and had taken a number of units offline to be able to accommodate this maintenance work. And then while they were down, the winter storm came through, severely dropped temperatures in the area. Um, this was followed by a natural gas curtailment. And here again, um, the assignment would be to recognize where physical damage occurred to the refinery equipment and piping, et cetera, and how long it took the refinery to complete those specific repairs for the freeze damages. Um, this kind of summary slide uh, shows the yellow periods that were associated with the planned maintenance, and then those extend through the blue shaded period, uh, which is where the winter storm and curtailment occurred. And then you can see the dark red bars for plant one and plant two. These represent the period from the date of loss where the insured would claim that that uh, damage occurred through till when the operations were restarted for that plant. And then the orange bar in part two represents a period of time where operations were unable to run due to a lack of feed from damaged plant one equipment and processes. And then in both plant one and plant two, you can see these pink lines that show the time that was associated with the repairs of the physically damaged property. Now, how these periods are interpreted as far as an individual's, you know, in policy is outside of what we might consider, but uh, you're basically breaking down a long period of time across lots of different units and plants so the adjuster could clearly understand what was happening and be able to apply the policy as appropriate. So this is kind of a high level view. Um, and I guess in this situation, we'd recommend using diagrams such as these to be able to determine the normal sequence of operations and product flow. So then you can identify where the freeze related damage and the associated repairs could cause a disruption to normal operations. In our example, the insured provided their work logs and maintenance schedules so we could go through and decipher where pieces of equipment were already offline due to the planned activities and then where the freeze damage took additional equipment offline and or caused a disruption in the feedstock causing that secondary unit to have to be taken down. Uh, so this next slide I'm going to show is a bit busy, uh, but it's basically just to drive home the complexity of some of these types of claims and just a visual way to show how you can step through each piece of the equation to get to the time specifically related to the freeze damaged equipment and repair and those knock on effects. <laughs> 
So what this is representing uh, is basically a timeline view of the connected plants and units. So in orange, you'll see where those two units were taken offline due to economic reasons and totally unrelated to the freeze. Um, in yellow, you'll see which units were down due to maintenance issues that were not related to the freeze. Um, some of them starting prior to the freeze, but then in other places, such as in unit nine, where it was after the freeze, but was identified to be maintenance related and not freeze related. Um, you'll see some purple areas where there's no clear documentation provided for being able to decipher what was going on in those units during those periods. Um, there's the blue bars where there were delays to processes due to cold weather, but nothing showing that there was physical damage identified at that point and causing those units to be offline. More that, you know, maybe the weather was extremely cold, staff wasn't able to make it in due to road conditions, et cetera. Um, not, a number of things could be happening there, but not a specific damage trigger that was exclusively preventing the unit from running at that point. Uh, there's the brief green period, which shows where the natural gas curtailment occurred and where units were affected by this situation. And again, however, the natural gas curtailment could be seen as a policy or coverage issue, you know, depending on the situation. But here it's just outlined to show, you know, the number of days that that would represent. And then lastly, we see the red bars where freeze related physical damage was identified and the repairs were being made um, specifically for these damages. What you'll also notice here are the gray bars and the associated colored dots. And what these illustrate are where downstream units were taken offline due to a lack of feed from another unit. And then the colored dot shows what issue is driving that particular situation. So for instance, the big red bar on unit seven, you know, freeze damage was discovered late after the event. So they had to take unit seven down. And as a result, units eight through 12 were taken offline because they're now missing their feed source from unit seven. So anyway, all of a very long, busy way of showing um, that these types of claims can have a lot of stuff going on. And our key advice here is to just really take the time to correctly understand the relationships between units and then to just methodize those damages back, you know, throughout the workflows. Okay, so across the energy refining space and really across you know, a lot of industries, um, companies are moving to more data heavy record keeping to control costs and to manage operational drivers. And with these transitions, the claims documentation and process on these large complex losses have become more aligned with this big data and less with the standard paper invoice billing and documentation. Um, so while this means that a claim can be presented with 50,000 line items. Um, it also means that with the right tools and skill sets, you can leverage that data to gain key insights into the scope and scale of the repair works. So by creating relationships between these various data sources, you can break these big claims down into manageable, understandable pieces for the adjusters to then be able to correctly allocate the cost and scope as per their policy definitions. So this last piece is really just applying the scope of damage that was determined to the submitted claim. And again, the standard for these types of claims is for the insured to present large data sets of information, you know, and less of the typical invoice backed line items. Uh, more and more what we're seeing for players in the energy space is use of a system called TRAC as their primary cost system. Um, so basically TRAC is a gate log system where vendor's time is logged to a particular location, work order or purchase order based on where and when they physically badge in and out. Um, this enables their time to be approved quickly and electronically by the company supervisors and for the wage rates and uh, number of hours to be accurately applied based on the contracts with that vendor. The system's very popular and for good reason. Um, it generally is a cost and time saver for the companies that use it. And now what's different about it is that um, no paper invoices are produced for this type of labor. Um, so insureds don't submit lengthy invoices with detailed time cards that you could use to verify the work scope. And instead, you know, the flow basically works like this, where the vendor bills their employee labor, materials, and equipment through track based on the designated purchase and work orders uh, from the insured. And then the insured receives these costs. They're designated to the appropriate a place in the financial system and an extract is provided to the claim with these line items. 
generally we're talking about you know thousands of line items to each claim and this is just the track portion um, we'll also typically receive exports from their financial or accounting system such as sap um, so just kind of diving in uh, we have some examples of the types of things that we consider looking at and chewing through on these massive data sets to just try to help make sense of what work was going on the durations the quantities etc and how this helps frame the understanding um, of the claim in relation to the damage so as an example, um, in one claim, we looked at a particular vendor that had a substantial percentage of the claim spend. And when we created this graph of man hours, what we saw was this increase in work leading up to June, and then this kind of dramatic spike in July. And what was odd to us is that based on their schedule of repairs, we expected to see the labor for this vendor essentially wrap up in June, um, as that's when the last piece of equipment that was damaged was installed. Um, and instead, we saw this giant increase. As it turns out, these graphs are related to that schedule that we showed earlier, where the insured realized that their facility was severely underdesigned and they needed to um, upgrade the tonnage of structural steel and concrete on site. And this work was all undertaken in the July timeframe, hence what we see here. And of course, the finding in this situation is that the materials, labor, and timeline associated with this work um, that was claimed would be out of scope relative to the damages incurred. Um, and so in this example, what we're looking at here are the overall labor curves for what was claimed by another insured. Um, here we did a data analysis by the different wage classes of workers and we're kind of able to construct this visualization of what type of work was going on and when, as well as the man hours associated with each discipline. So we could then compare these with industry metrics to get a basis for what types of quantities they would likely be associated with. Um, in this chart, the red you see is demo related work, you know, which makes sense in the time frame immediately following an incident. Uh, the green is your electrical and instrumentation installation and so on. So this kind of view of the data we found to be particularly insightful and meaningful um, in just being able to highlight areas where we may need to request more information or support from the insured for their claim in order to validate um, the costs. This next visualization is actually not on the cost side, but just an example of how you might be able to leverage data analysis to bring attention to items that may be unrelated to the damage scope. Uh, so in this example, what we are looking at is a chart that shows the number of loop checks done. So loop checks basically verifying the functionality of your electrical and instrumentation runs um, done as a pre-commissioning step before startup. And what stuck out here uh, for us was that it appeared that all of the loop check checks had been completed in May and our understanding was that the electrical work was completed at that time and then we notice here in July there's this uptick of loop checks done and as it turns out uh, these are related to the previous case I showed where the insured determined they needed to rip out some cabling and reinstall fireproof cabling and that was done here in July. Now because that cabling was an upgrade and not related to the property damage by the fire, you know, while it was claimed, it would be out of scope for our analysis. So these kind of insights can be difficult to find when reviewing a claim on an invoice by invoice level. Um, but our suggestion is to look for ways to leverage the data sets you do receive, um, as we just find this type of analysis to be particularly helpful on large complex claims where there's just a tremendous amount, you know, of data and cost flying around. Um, and just the you know big cost exposure that needs to be managed appropriately. So in summary, uh, the key points that we wanted to share with you today that relate to these four main areas of analysis, you know, on complex energy claims are these. So one, you know, when validating the extent of damages on these large energy losses, pay particular attention to the initial development of your materials and equipment quantities list, as this will drive the big spend within your supporting disciplines, as well as on your timeline and, and just key to the entire evaluation. Um, second, when compiling the initial scope of repair cost estimate, as much as you're able, you know, align the process with that of the insured so that variances due to policy coverage, et cetera, can be more easily and readily um, identified because the underlying assumptions and basis of the cost model will generally be the same. Uh, third, so 
when analyzing the timeline for these types of repairs, our main piece of advice is that assumptions are absolutely critical and to make sure as you're making these that they are well documented and also have a basis of support, you know, such as references to a particularly uh, a particular industry standard benchmark. And then in the fourth in the cost reconciliation phase, you know, we encourage you to leverage data insights, big data in helping you to understand your claim scope and then constructing, being able to construct a precise and accurate analysis. And so with that, just thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate your participation in the event and ask if there are any questions for Robert or myself. Yes, thank you so much, Gabriella. Um, really cool information. Um, if you guys don't mind, if you have any questions, you can submit them in the Q&A portion uh, or the Q&A uh, button there. I am seeing several messages come in uh, saying that it was great information, um, excellent information, super interesting, but no questions. People seem to be uh, just happy with it. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Thank you very much. Well, we have one. You don't, you don't go too far. <laughs> okay, so um, how do you mitigate difficulty discussions with the insured for in or out of scope repairs? So, I mean, I think what we have found works is like we talked about with the assumptions or we're just being very clear on how we get to our um, analysis of what's in scope and out of scope. If we have a solid case, you know, and it's driven by data, it's driven by equipment lists and things like that, you know, while it's, I guess, a tough conversation because they would obviously want more money than we're suggesting, I think it, I don't think there's a lot of pushback when you have the right kind of backup. Um, I don't know that it might, might be more of an adjuster question or Robert, I don't know if you have any insight, um, but I think that's with the right preparation and, and documentation and being able to point to benchmarks and stuff, you know, it's just, it's a hard case for them to make a lot of times. Yeah, I, Gabby, I think it's your first point tying to materials lists, right? Getting that first step down is key because you're able to just show a very clear tie between here's what we saw was damaged, you know, here's the materials we're questioning, right? And so if you do it that way, you at least create the opportunity for a conversation where they can then position what they did for policy coverage considerations. Cool, got another question. How do you handle equipment that is damaged by fire and explosion that had already that already has corrosion damage. You had mentioned that in one of your earlier slides, Gabriella. Robert, did you want to talk about that, or I can? Uh, sure. Um, really, what you're looking at is you're you're determining what is that failure mechanism, right? Um, in in these plants, everything is corroded. Um, in that particular example, Gabby used when the insured went and did the inspection, the, the third party inspector stated the reason for needing to replace the equipment was actually due to the corrosion. So it, what you're really saying is if it hadn't have been so rusty, we could have repaired the fire damage. Um, and what you're really breaking down to is like, you know, weldability of that metal, right? So there wasn't enough metal there left to do welding repairs. Um, from a code perspective. So it, 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 that, that's a corrosion one. Um, but if it's rusty and it's damaged due to fire, you know, these policies typically cover replacement costs for uh, like kind equipment. So they just, they get the price of the new equipment. Cool. Next question. What is the approximate timeline it would take you to create the quantity list for a claim that size? Oh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> Cause it, it I wanted you to jump on that one, Gabby. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, there, there are some insureds that, you know, hand over, 
everything we, we request right off the bat, the plot plans, the diagrams and stuff like that, you know, and, and you're probably looking at, I don't know, a couple, couple weeks, if you get all the information just right up front, going through all of that, validating damages, you know, sometimes waiting for, you know, different inspection reports from third parties. Um, but then there's other ones. I mean, it, it just drags on and on because they withhold information or, you know. Well, they don't have it. Right. Or, like or they don't. The older, oh, yeah. yeah. They don't have it. The older the unit, the less the documentation. You know, we've had a lot where they'll just say, yeah, we don't have that documentation. We, we don't know what was really out there because the facility is 50 years old. Um, and again, in the industry s- s- sector, as people are going carbon neutral and different players are getting in- involved, you're seeing turnover of asset ownership happening two and three years mm. sometimes, and you lose that paperwork and continuity of ownership. Yes. Yep. Um, so you are not preparing the quantities yourself. You are depending on the insureds or third parties to provide those documents. Uh, I would say both. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go out and do measurements, but again, due to the nature of like a refinery, right? If it's a newer refinery, they have drawings that you can go do this, this quantity takeoff from, right? Um, and that's the easiest way. And it's actually most convenient for the insured because otherwise on the flip side, if you're, if you're doing um, direct field measurements, which we do as well, it's a very um, arduous involved process and it takes time, right? So again, if you think about a refinery losing a million dollars a day, um, it's hard for us as an engineering firm to go and say, okay, we need to go out in the field and we need you know, probably four weeks to do measurements of everything that was damaged. If you think about the magnitude events Gabby covered, um, that's a month of time where you're basically telling the insured, hold off on demolition because we need to go and get our tape measures out, right? Or $30 million. So you, you, you try to balance that interruption to the repair period to do your measurements um, against the need for perfect information. Is that a way, Gabby, is that how you would think about it? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Great, another question. In the case of the company who discovered their new building was underbuilt and needed more steel and concrete, is there a layer of lawsuits behind the claim against the engineers or the contractors of the original build? Or that's um, something that's not in your, uh, your site? So um, again, this is coming from my experience on the owner side. When you get into these contracts, these large energy energy assets, um, either one, you see that the owner is kind of self-performed the design work, right? So it's either self-performed or if they use a third party, there's usually full indemnification um, for certain types of design defects, right? So in that particular case, the owner, while they use, they, while they bought a licensed technology and they use a third party to do the engineering, because of the indemnification and that, that owner oversight during the design process, the owner basically held the liability for that design defect. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean there wouldn't be a lawsuit because um, you can always sue, especially in the States, <laughs> but there is a de- indemnification there in the contracts between the multiple parties um, doing this work where usually the liability always goes to the owner. Okay, great. I have another one here. Um, not sure if it's a statement or a question. Most large companies have a work plan for maintenance and future upgrades necessary. Are these taken into consideration in setting times, normally five plus year plan? Not sure if that's a question, but yeah, um, I mean, Gabby can speak to it too because she she worked in that finance business part of an owner plan. Um, but from a claim where you see that come in is, you know, if you have a, a chemical plant that goes down due to fire, they'll do what they they'll they'll you know quote unquote accelerate maintenance, right? They have maintenance items they were waiting to execute for the next outage, 
and they're going to take advantage of this kind of unplanned outage to repair their fire and do these other maintenance works right and so yeah we we, we will definitely ask for hey what is what is your maintenance plan what, where's your maintenance schedule for that work you did just to make sure there's no commingling of works yes cool Great. Well, that is the end of the questions um, that, that we've seen come in. Thank you very much, Gabriella and uh, Robert. Really appreciate your time on this and uh, all the information you've provided us. Um, folks, let's take a 15-minute break, and we'll coming, we will be coming back to the last presentation, which actually will end early. So um, stay tuned and uh, maybe stretch and go grab another coffee or tea and, and we'll see you guys in 15 minutes. <laughs>